can I just begin by saying that one of the real pleasures of, of uh, being a fan and then turning into a film critic is that if you hang in there long enough, you not only get to see all of the films as they come out, pretty much, but you also get the opportunity, the privilege indeed, of interviewing the people who made you want to do the job in the first place. And one of those people is John Carpenter. When I first saw uh, Salt on Precinct 13 and then Halloween and the subsequent movies, those were among the movies that inspired me to want to take up this job. So it's a real pleasure for me to have him here tonight and be able to put him on the spot. Um, now, John, I know you were actually born in uh, New York State, but you moved very quickly, I think, at the age of three to uh, Bowling Green, Kentucky. And um, your early formative influences, w one of the questions that um, I'd like to start with, which is quite a big one, but I hope we can worry away at it a bit. It's um, often occurred to me that people who are only children or who live a fairly solitary childhood um, sort of turn in on themselves and, and get into the fantasy and horror genre. It's become a, a recurring thing I've noticed. Do you think there's, there's anything in that idea at all? There possibly is. I think in my case, uh, my dad was a music teacher. He went to the Eastman School of Music and got his PhD. And he's from upstate New York. And he moved us down to Bowling Green, Kentucky, right in the middle of the Bible Belt. So you're talking about fundamentalist Christians surrounding this kind of intellectual. And I think that every time I would wake up or be with my parents, I'd be listening to classical music. My father would teach me to play the, the piano and the violin, and I'd walk outside, and it was a whole different world. And I wasn't sure where I belonged, so I went right into movies. And I think that's probably the biggest part of it. But for my own personal reasons, I sought out solace from life in films. I think that somebody said in the Horror Writers of America last year that we all kind of create from our own pain in one way or the other. And I think I probably sought escape in movies, and uh, that's where I found it. Were there any particular movies that you remember from your childhood or perhaps from later on that, that, that had an effect on you and, and caused you to, to immerse yourself in that? The, the one movie I remember the most was a film that came out in 1953. It was called It Came From Outer Space. It was in 3D. And I saw it in 3D. In the opening of the movie, this meteor comes across the sky and comes right out of the screen and blew up in my little four-year-old face. <laughs> and I jumped up and ran to the back of the theater. I was completely terrified. And then I stopped and said, whoa, is that cool? <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's what got me started. I said, I want to do that. You know, I want to hit him in the face with a meteor. So, uh, but I saw everything. I, I saw musicals, I saw um, westerns. I, I came into the movie business wanting to make westerns, uh, but they, they, don't, they don't let me do that. You then began, I think, making uh, movies on 8mm from quite an early age. Were they influenced by, were they monster movies? Was that the style they of movie? They were a little bit of everything, yeah, they were. I tried a little stop motion and I tried some Steve Reeves gladiator movies. And, <laughs> eh, although I didn't look much like Steve Reeves, but I, I tried them. And uh, I tried, I got my, enlisted my friends, and I was particularly good with the handheld look. I was impatient with a the, with the tripod, and, but I learned about editing. Uh, what I used to do was I'd direct my friends to come into the shot, I'd stop the camera, I'd turn around, show a monster or something, then I'd turn back and have the friend react. My father said, look, you know what, this is editing. This is an editing machine. You just go click, and you can cut the film. And I realized, oh, I can have my friend come all the way in, do his whole, re see the monster, do his whole reaction, run out. Then later on, turn around and shoot the monster. So it was a good education. Yeah. An education which you, you then pursued um, at the University of Southern California in a slightly more formal academic context. Um, do you think that film school as it was then was a good grounding for you? And you th do you think that film school <coughs> has changed in any way since you were there? I was in film school during what I would call the golden age of, of, of that particular learning experience, it, the masters were still alive. I saw Orson Welles, Howard Hawks, John Ford, Alfred Hitchcock, Roman Polanski, Louis Bunuel came down, Robert Wise, came, all, all the guys came down to talk to us about films and they showed their movies. John Ford, we had all of his films in, this, in like a three or four weekend period and then Ford came down and talked and he talked and then showed The Quiet Man and he explained what he was doing. It was like, whoa, what an education. Orson Welles had us in uh, 
when he showed uh, the chimes at midnight, and he talked about it, and he talked about his career, and you just can't, this, that's not available anymore. It's not available to ask Howard Hawks a question. How did you do this, or why did you do this? And uh, film school for us at the time, the first thing they, t they told us, there were 99 of us in the first class, and they said, well, one of, one of you out of this class is going to make it, one out of 99. We all knew it was going to be us. Every person in there knew it was going to be us. <laughs> And they said, what you're here to do is make personal films. You're here to make films from your heart, okay? And all of us in the back of my, our minds said, no, we want to go to Hollywood and be famous <laughs> and make commercial movies. But they beat into us that no matter what film you're doing, whether you're doing a movie for a studio or whether you're doing a movie for 50 cents, you've got to put something of yourself in it. You've got to make it come from your heart some way, even if it's a crass and commercial product. And I think. That and learning about movie business from uh, the camera all the way to sound to editing, we had to do everything. We had to, our tests were putting together a Mitchell, uh, assembling it, loading it, shooting a scene, un and taking it apart. And then we'd process the film and the teacher would see if it was in focus and it would pass or fail. If it was out of focus, you failed, you failed the class. And uh, they made us work, but it taught us, all of us, what movie, what it was about invaluable experience and it's changed a great deal because now movies have changed a great deal and I'm from <coughs> a slightly different generation of uh, a film goer I was in the crossover uh, from the old classics through the 50s and 60s as it evolved and uh, nowadays all you're getting is corporate American movies and McDonald's movies from Hollywood the entire world has been taken over by that when I was in film school we saw voices from from Italy and Japan and France. We, we heard voices from uh, Great Britain. We saw cinema from all over the world. And there's not an experience like that now in film school. It's all uh, Hollywood films, and that's too bad. Now, one of the short films that you made there, The Resurrection of Bronco Billy, uh, won an Oscar for what I think is called uh, Best Short Live Action Film. Is that the category? Um, did you think then that that would be your, your passport to Hollywood, and did that prove to be the case? It proved not to be the case. Of course, we all hoped it would. And uh, the chairman of the department brought the Oscar down in a paper bag and let, let the crew let us see it, and then took it away again. <laughs> um, USC exploited us on that. We put our own money into the film and, and really spent a lot of money making it. And they have a releasing company there. So they released the movie and they made quite a bit of money saying this is an Academy Award winning film. So I just decided to get my revenge. So I, I made a senior project, a uh, graduate project there, and it turned into Dark Star. So I took the negative out of the lab and went and made a theatrical film out of it. Just sort of say, okay, you make money on that one, I'll make money on this one. <laughs> they didn't like that very much. Um, it did take you some time, however, to get Dark Star together. Um, the estimates seem to vary somewhere between three and four years. four years. But at the end of that time, you had a movie which, which now has a, an amazing cult following, but, but didn't seem to um, quite connect with audiences, or certainly not with distributors, perhaps. It was, like. it was the same story you just asked. Is this going to be your ticket to Hollywood? Dark Star was done. Is this my ticket to Hollywood? No. 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 It was shown at a film festival in Los Angeles to a, a very, very wonderful reception. And then it was released and no one went. <laughs> no one went to see it. Zero. And I remember getting with my daily variety and reading a review in there and oh, oy, peace. And thinking, no, no, you missed the whole point. You missed the whole point. No one, uh, no one cared to pull up in the limo and say, Mr. Carpenter, we're ready for you on the set. This was my, my dream was no instead. My father called me on the phone and said, you know, you're going to have to change your lifestyle because I'm not going to support you anymore. So. <laughs> and so then I uh, said, okay, Dad, and I started writing screenplays for a living and just churned them out. And uh, Luckily, I sold a couple and uh, off I went. Did the screenplays that you sold immediately turn into films, however? Or? No. no. <laughs> you can make a great living in Hollywood by writing movies that never get made. There's a, the minimum for writing a screenplay, seriously, is unbelievable. And um, I, I had it down pretty good after several years. I would go in and have a story meeting and pitch an idea to a studio executive. 
And then I'd go home and spend a couple of days doing an outline. And I, you'd have a deadline to turn in your first draft. Let's say it was three months. So I'd have a good time for about two and a half months. <laughs> and the last week, sit down and bang this thing out and turn it in. And it's, it's a great living after a while. <laughs> Some of the movies got made. Eyes of Laura Mars was one of them. Uh, Black Moon Rising was one of them. There's one now that's, oh, God, it's resurfaced. It's, it was a, after Jaws, the, they tried to exploit all these animal attack, nature attack movies. <laughs> and I, I, got, uh, I got the rattlesnake movie. <laughs> and it's, now it's resurfaced again to haunt me. It's called Diamondback. Oh, don't go to see it. Oof. <laughs> and there's one now that's being made called Meltdown with, with Dolph Lundgren. And I have real serious questions about that one, too. <laughs> Can I ask you a specific question about Eyes of Laura Mars? It, there's an apocryphal story um, that uh, one of the devices in the film is, is that the, the heroine uh, has these kind of hallucinatory attacks in which she sees from the point of view of the killer. Is it true that in one of the versions um, of your script that you actually had a climax in which she was having to fight off the attacker but seeing from the attacker's point of view? Absolutely. That was the whole point of the movie. And they blew it. And after they shot this movie, the producer called me up and said, um, you know, uh, we're having a little trouble. Uh, do you have any idea how we should do these visions? I said, well, you, you should do them with, a, with this new camera they have called a Steadicam or a Panoglide. And it's a gyroscopic camera that you mount. And it, it can imitate the human vision. You can move around. And did you do that? And, well, no, we didn't do that. <laughs> well, did you have the killer attack her and she was defending herself by hiding and seeing through his eyes. No, we didn't do that either. <laughs> I can't help you. <laughs> I can't help. That was John Peters, by the way, the, the, the <laughs> producer. The, the next movie, uh, and a much-loved movie from which we've just seen an extract, Assault on Precinct 13. Um, you made that in 1976. And uh, you came here with it to the London Film Festival in 1977. Now, I think I'm right in saying that the the reaction that the film got in Europe was quite different from the action that it, that it got in the States. Was there an extent to which that, that helped the push the movie along? It was released in the United States, and once again, it, nobody went. And when they went, they said, oh, come on. And over here, uh, it was handled with tremendous love and care by uh, someone who I owe a whole lot to, the distributor of the film. And I owe a whole lot to uh, this place because it was shown here. And it's, it, it kicked my career off. By the time I got back in 1977 to the United States, word of how it was received here had, had, had gone over there. And I started getting some jobs. So that, that was really the one that got going. It's amazing. I owe it, I owe it to you, to you guys. You personally, I owe it to you. Yes, <laughs> I would like to say that in those days, I had to pay to see movies. And oh. I did pay to see it. <laughs> To just pursue the assault on Precinct 13 a little bit and introduce a, a couple of themes we'll probably come back to, you've, um, you've never shied away from the idea of making references to other movies, particularly to classical Hollywood movies. And there are two movies that seem to sort of uh, loom large in Assault on Precinct 13. One is Rio Bravo, and a little less talked about, but it seems to me also Night of the Living Dead. Um, I've heard the birds, too, and I don't know where that came from. <laughs> <laughs> I don't get that at all. How do you approach the, the idea of the references, though? Do you see that as a game for the people in the audience who will get those nods, or do you see that as a way of telling the story because you can tap into that common knowledge that, that the audience <coughs> has with you? At the time, before video, before uh, movies, you could buy them and own them and study them, and, and they were so well known, the general public didn't know. They didn't know, really know who Howard Hawks was. I mean. If you're a film scholar, yes, or if you're a film student, or if you're literate, but the general audience didn't know. So I put him in. Uh, the, the editor on uh, um, Assault on Precinct 13 was John T. Chance, who's the John Wayne character in Rio Bravo. It was a direct way of saying to anybody who knew, look, I'm, I'm just ripping off Howard Hawks. Don't blame me too much. But uh, it, it, now it's become a real, real big thing. But back then, it was an unknown. It was a way of sneaking things in. As I recall, I used the name of all my high school friends and sweethearts in some of my movies, and the names of the streets in Bowling Green, just for laughs. And they, they got it back in Bowling Green, but nobody else gets it. So. <laughs> it's OK. 
we can, we, there are a couple of uh, uh, familiar uh, names in the audience tonight, and uh, I know that your producer and wife, Sandy King, is here, for example, and, and may uh, answer questions uh, at the end when you have your own questions. Uh, but also in the audience tonight, I believe that we have somebody called Michael Myers. Um, <laughs> can you explain to me how um, Mr. Myers um, inspired the uh, villain, the name for the villain in Halloween, your next picture? Michael Myers was the man I was referring to earlier. He was the distributor of Assault on Precinct 13, who single-handedly, with great love and affection, uh, got critics to come in and see it and enjoy it. I don't know what he did. but. Uh, uh, I decided I would name the, uh, the cold, merciless, robotic killer after, <laughs> after, after him. A generous gesture, I must say. Um, let's talk a little bit about Halloween, because Halloween was a, a quantum jump, I think we can say, uh, in terms of your career. You, you made the movie for uh, about $300,000, I think, and it grossed, again, estimates seem to range somewhere between 50 and $75 million worldwide. But the original idea, I think, came from the distributor of the movie who just came to you and said, I want a movie about <laughs> a guy who kills babysitters. Was it really that simple? Um, because of Assault on Precinct 13 was shown here, and I was in London, I went out to meet uh, Mustafa Akkad. He was out at Twickenham Studios, I believe, at the time. And we talked about making a film. And then when I got back to Los Angeles, Erwin Yablons brought me in, and he had made a deal for $300,000 movies, and he made several of them. One was a Charles Band film called Laser Blast, and one was another one. And he said, I want to make a movie called The Babysitter Murders, about uh, this killer that's stalking babysitters. And uh, I said, OK, OK. <laughs> and uh, and be because I, wanted, I needed a job. I wanted to direct. And um, he called me up and he said, well, why don't we set it on Halloween night? As a matter of fact, why don't we call it Halloween? OK. So I wrote the screenplay, and uh, we shot it in Los Angeles, the street that the killer is on throughout the whole movie is right off of Sunset. It's by a, a Kentucky Fried Chicken. And uh, you can actually see it if you, if you turn right and if the Blockbuster's on one side, Kentucky Fried Chicken's on the other. And right down there is Illinois. And it's a, it's a great little street. And Donald Pleasance was in it. It terrified me at the time because I was such a fan of Donald's. I remember meeting him at a restaurant. And he, he came in and sat down and he said, now, I don't understand the script. <laughs> and I, I, I froze inside. I, I'd never dealt with, with as great an actor as Donald, and he was one of my favorite actors. Oh my God, he said, the only reason I'm here is my daughter saw Assault in Precinct 13 and said I should do this. So will you explain to me what's going on in this script? <laughs> oh, I, but once we got working, we had a blast, and Donald is one of my dearest friends. And he's a wonderful man. And, uh, We've done several movies together. It was finished. Um, I went on to do another film. And it, it was slowly released in the, regionally in the United States by this, by this distributor. And every single review was bad. They called it a turkey. This, this is not scary. This is the dumbest movie ever made. How embarrassing. And accidentally, somehow, somebody at the Village Voice saw it and gave it a great review. And then the movie was re-reviewed by everybody. This is a great film. <laughs> well, by the time this happened, I was making Elvis, and which is a TV movie with Kurt Russell. And all this activity, I, th I thought, oh my god, I know another movie that didn't get good reviews and it's not going to work. And all of a sudden, all these studio executives began to show up on the set. Said, hey, how you doing? What's happening? I thought, what's going on here? So then I signed my, my two-picture deal with Avco Embassy, and I was on my way. Very strange experience. So when people say, and Halloween really did, really did it for you, didn't it? Well, it, it was odd. I think Halloween hit at the right, it was at the right time. It was a lucky thing that it came out, and the way it was handled was unusual and bizarre. And I think you cannot predict these things. None of us had any idea that Halloween would, would do what it did. Well, we were just trying to make a movie. We're just trying to put something together and get it going, and it turned out to be uh, it turned out to be pretty scary for the audiences. So, that's it. I think that perhaps you're selling yourself a little bit short there. There were two elements in the film in particular which which people uh, were affected by. One was the use of what was then uh, a fairly rare commodity, the sort of gyroscopic or panaglide <laughs> camera. 
Had you seen that in another movie or was that a piece of technology that you came across and did you always intend to use it to, to that extent in the movie? I had seen it used extremely well in a movie that, that was critically really bombed, the, the, the sequel to The Exorcist, the John Borman film, Exorcist Two. And it was a shot where a bird flies down from some kind of nest and this camera was hauling. And it was this, this, on this Panaglide and this guy was running for all his might down this ramp. I don't know how they stopped him because those things are really heavy. <laughs> so I thought, you know, this is kind of a cheap way of getting a tracking shot done. And it's also kind of creepy. You know, it, gyroscopic camera is mounted on an operator. It's like a bit, you wear it. So you're wearing this huge camera and you're supposed to kind of squat down like this and it kind of bobs like, up and down like this and you run with it or you move around like this and it kind of glides and it gives a very strange feeling. It's not handheld, where you can even feel the breath of the operator like this, or it's not a dolly, where you've got uh, uh, wheels and you're operating it very mechanically and very precisely. It's a completely different feel. So I decided to overuse it. I used it in, in scenes as a dolly. I used it as point of view. I used it everywhere. With kind of the idea that maybe you'd get confused and not know, well, maybe it's him. Maybe it's him watching, or maybe it isn't him watching. I'll put you ill at ease so you're not sure when I'm going to jump out and do my cheap trick of making you scream and jump. And it seemed to work out. But the music also reinforced that. And, and you've always said uh, in interviews that, that one of the things you've admired about Hawks' films is that they establish a mood, they establish an atmosphere. And having done that, uh, built up, as it were, an environment for the characters, there's a, there's a way in which you can wring more suspense out of that. When you work on the music and, and try to achieve that, do you have that music in mind as the film is being shot, or is it something that you put on afterwards in, in the editing process? How does that? It's all done afterwards. And what we, what we do now is slap on some temp music from other movies and see how it works. And then if it works pretty well, we kind of go in that direction. Well, if it's orchestral, or if it's a real horror score, or sometimes we'll put on, uh, in the Mouth of Madness, we put on Metallica, Enter Sandman. And uh, wow, this really works. So. Um, it, depending on how the, the film feels with the tent music, then I'll go in and just start improvising on a synthesizer in the general direction of what the tent music was and create a theme. So you start with the scene, the most difficult scene in the film, and score it. And then out of that comes a theme, then try to apply it all the way through. And um, it's a fun process. I really enjoy it. One other thing about Halloween, the opening shot of Halloween is a direct ripoff of Touch of Evil. I don't know if you're probably familiar with that. That's the big, long 10-minute shot. Um, I recommend uh, this Halloween, they're going to come out with a laser disc, Criterion is, of Bob Halloween in, in widescreen. And Deborah Hill gives the greatest description of what it was like to shoot that. Because it's a one tracking shot through a house that starts behind a tree, and it moves toward a house. You look in a window. You see some characters. You come around the backyard in through the back door. So we're looking one direction, OK? We're looking one direction at first this way. As we're coming around the back to turn around, the entire house is filled with technicians turning every light the other direction. <laughs> so there's wild noise going on. So we come in the kitchen. Now the lights are all turned around. <laughs> we come in and we grab the knife. We move through the front room and we go up the stairs, which is lit for our direction. And we were in the bedroom, and we killed the sister. And we've got to come out and go the other direction. And as we're killing the sister, you're hearing this tremendous noise of technicians <laughs> turning lights around and wham. And we come plunging down the stairs, outside, up pull the parents. They come up. And then the poor operator who's been doing this is about three or four minutes shot and has to kneel down because it's a point of view of a child. And then literally at the end, he was falling down with his camera. And it was kind of falling over on top of him. But it actually somehow worked we did it in we did two takes and we cut them together on the mask it took one night to shoot and really it's the most ambitious shot I think I've ever done in a film and it was done on a three hundred thousand dollar movie which only goes to show you that if you have all the money in the world it doesn't mean anything you got to have the guts to try it end of story can I just ask you in brackets there, since you brought up the, the subject of the Criterion laser discs, what's your attitude towards the, the phenomenon of director's cuts? Because I know that a laser disc has, has come out recently, which doesn't actually stitch the scene back into Escape from New York, but, but includes it as an extra at, at the end of the, the discs. 
Can you explain what your attitude towards that is? For instance, James Cameron has, has, has reworked a number of his films. Would you ever consider doing that yourself? I think the, I think the main purpose behind it is to, to reach into your back pocket and take your wallet out and take some money out of it and put it back. Um, I think it's a good idea. For some films, I love buying laser discs because, for instance, uh, getting hard-boiled in the original Chinese version, there's nothing like it. I mean, I, I, seriously, you don't even need to, to know what's going on in terms of language to love the movie. What an experience. And it's fun to see old films w well done. Reworking movies, I don't know. Uh, I wouldn't want to do it with mine. I would prefer to have the theatrical version. Hopefully, the, the version you see on the screen is the version that's the right one. Uh, there was a big hoodoo about Blade Runner. There was going to be this director's cut on Blade Runner. It was going to clear up all this stuff. Uh huh? Huh? <laughs> well, say what? <laughs> I don't know. Take your wallet out. Take them. <laughs> Let's move on to, to The Fog, which again uh, was a picture in a way which uh, established a mood and an atmosphere and an environment, although <coughs> I have to say personally, um, it, the plot wasn't always uh, quite in one place. One of the problems with that movie was that having established that extraordinary mood, you established a number of different groups of people in different spaces and kept cutting between them. Looking back on the film, um, which I personally love, um, do you feel that that was... That, you yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I can say that. I'll never understand you guys. I no. really never will. <laughs> but you have said before that well, one of the problems you had was, in a sense, if you have a film like Night of the Living Dead, you get everyone in the same place, shit happens, it's bad. The problem with the fog is that people are in different places. <clears throat> You're absolutely right. The thing about the fog, that was one of the biggest learning experiences for me on a film. It's real easy when you've... When you, when you make a film and everyone sees it, you can say, oh, I did this and this and this. When you have nothing on film and you have to make one, that's tough. Okay. So I decided, well, this will be an easy movie. It's a ghost story. I can do this. I finished the film. It wasn't scary. It was stupid. <laughs> so we had to go back and reshoot sequences and put scares in the movie to make it work. And in doing so, I recall we had a release date, it was about a month away. So what you're talking about doing is more principal photography with the actors, more editing, more sound recording, more music recording, a dub, and then it goes into the theaters in one month. And I cannot tell you the kind of terror <laughs> that I felt. And it, I, I will never forget that time. I thought, this is it, this is the end. I can't do this anymore. I'm not any good as a filmmaker. This is terrible. And we slapped this thing together and it came out and actually made some money. I mean, it's unbelievable. And it was a total save job. It was a, it was a job that uh, all I can say is we patched it together and, and made it work. What would I do different? I would sit down and rewrite it, not write that script. It didn't work. It did not work. You then moved on to Escape from New York, which uh, was shown on TV here again recently, and you worked again with Kurt Russell. You, I think you'd already made the Elvis TV movie by that time. Um, Kurt Russell is, is obviously a favorite actor of yours. What is the quality that you find in him and, and that you thought that he had that made him, in a sense, the, the carpenter hero <coughs> you needed for that picture? We're do, you're doing a movie called Elvis. Okay, let me go back to that. It's a three-hour TV movie. No director in town would do this movie because they were so frightened of it. Elvis had just died like the year before. And they were frightened of what it was going to be. It was going to be campy or stupid. And I, I said, Elvis? God, let me, I want to make a movie about Elvis. I love Elvis. I've always loved it. Kurt Russell walks in the office, and I've never met him before. And I've seen, you know, the computer wore tennis shoes or some Disney movie, and I don't, I don't remember it. And here's the guy who's going to play Elvis, and in walks Kurt. He doesn't look like Elvis. And they hired me, and I've just done a horror movie, and I, I don't know Elvis. And he says, hey, how you doing, man? Let's go. And it was his absolute courage. His, and he got out there, and he was Elvis. And I thought, this guy can play anything. So I said, how would you like to play uh, the baddest guy in the world who's uh, put his eye out himself? And 
doesn't care about anybody. And he's caught between a, a, a police state and a prison. And in the end, he doesn't save the world. He throws away the world's salvation and walks off. He said, great, I'm aboard. <laughs> he, has no, he has no fear. He has no fear. He's a great actor. He's a great instinctual actor. He was trained in the old days. He was trained by Disney. He's my kind of actor. I, there are several actors and actresses that I've worked with that I would work with again and again and again. Sam Neill is one. Uh, the, only diff the only thing about Sam Neill that is maybe slightly puts him above Kurt is that Sam Neill is one of the top five Beach Boys fans in the world. <laughs> and I, I'm number three, and maybe he's number two. But uh, Jeff Bridges is the same way. I mean, th these guys bring something amazing to the set. It makes my job easy. And they can, they can carry a movie. And Kurt is definitely one of them. We're talking about... Uh, perhaps venturing into the sequel land. Since Los Angeles has been hit with so many disasters recently, it looks ripe for the pickings. <laughs> the, one of the distinctive qualities of that film, uh, apart from the kind of the whole dystopian vision within the prison <coughs> island itself, was the fairly extensive use of computer graphics um, on screen. How interested are you? I mean, a lot of your films actually involve special effects and involve computer effects, but how interested are you personally in that side of it? Do you see it as something to get the job done, or do you like someone like James Cameron, or, who I think worked second unit on Escape from New York? He was, he do you was immerse a, yourself in that? Cameron was a matte painter on it. He, was painted, he painted New York out in San Fernando Valley. It was really hysterical on a piece of glass. It was great. N there, it's special effects are entirely functional to the story. It's always the story first. I don't care what anybody says. You're a storyteller. Director's a storyteller. Special effects come second. If you're going to tell a story about a horrible monster from outer space, and you want the audience to believe there's a horrible monster from outer space, special effects have got to be great. If you're going to tell a story uh, about a Terminator who comes back and has this giant fight in a truck, well, that serves the story. But it's not for its own sake. It shouldn't be. Then you're just, you're just off and in gratuitous land. Do you think that that's an accusation that could be leveled at the thing, where the, the effects are so extraordinary that they almost uh, become a, a kind of self-contained spectacle? Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> that was the shortest answer, I reckon. Uh, let's move on then to the question of uh, horror and humor. We, we spoke about this briefly a couple of days ago, but one of the things that's always fascinated me about The Thing is that I personally think that The Thing is one of the grimmest and most frightening of your movies. But in the interviews about it, you constantly refer to it as a black comedy. Not a bleak comedy, but a black comedy. And you express some surprise that the audience didn't find the monsters and the kind of the gruey scenes of, of the thing emerging from the dogs or emerging from the people um, hysterically funny. Now, you, you've, <laughs> you've always said that, that, that what you think films do is get the audience to sort of project their own fantasies onto the screen, but in this case, they seem to have projected the wrong ones. Well. There's a scene in the thing, it, Rob Bottin, who did the special effects, who's a really tremendous artist, came to me and said, you know, this is an opportunity. This is a creature that imitates life forms and has probably been around the universe and has imitated everything. So we can make it anything and everything. It can do anything. So this guy's head pulls off, turns upside down, grows legs and two eyes and crawls across the floor. And I started laughing. I said, you're kidding, aren't you? You're kidding, you know, and, you, know, you expect the audience to be scared by that? He said, sure. I said, okay, well, let's try it. And boy, were they scared by it. And I, it was a shock to me because, uh, well, I, I, knew, I knew what was coming because they just released E.T. two weeks before. Oh, mama. And everybody was going in tears and uh, bye. <laughs> We're dead, we're dead. It's just the opposite. It's the absolute reverse, you know? It says you will not be saved. You're stuck out there. You can't trust anyone. You don't know if the person next to you is going to suddenly reach out and rip your head off. And I guess the audiences didn't really want to see that then. Uh, we had a few previews, and the first one we had, it was, oh, it's unbelievable. 
the audience is packed and all the universal executives are sitting there and it's one of these terrible times. Sid Scheinberg is there and on Ned Tannen is sitting there. And during the dog scene, okay, you know, you're in the kennel and all these dogs are acting up and all of a sudden this dog splits open and this lady <laughs> and she heads to the bathroom. And Sid Scheinberg's wife, the lady in Jaws, was in the bathroom at the time. And I guess this lady just threw right up, right, right there on the floor. And we had a serious problem. <laughs> a serious problem. It was too intense, literally too intense. Not for me, but for the general audience. They took it real seriously. And I suppose that there is a part of the movie that is, that is very serious. It's a drama. It's a very sc serious, scary drama. But I find, you know, parts of it to be extremely funny. Uh, in retrospect, I now see that I was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> you took on a challenge with Christine, which not many people, I think, uh, would have done without some trepidation, <laughs> the, the idea of a killer car. It was a Stephen King novel, and I know that you had wanted to do Firestarter uh, at one time, but you, you did Christine. Yeah. And the killer car thing was something of a problem. How did you approach that in the sense, did you then shift more emphasis towards the transformation of the, of the teenage hero in, a, in, a, in an attempt to defend <coughs> him? Well, I tell you what, you learn a lot of things in a career from, from a perspective of a person who used to have hair and it was dark to somebody who's losing it and it gets white. And you learn things in between. One of the things I learned was that you have to deeply connect with the material before you embark on a movie, or you're going to find yourself stranded on a strange island. And due to circumstances in my life at the time, I took on the project, and I realized, looking back on it, and this sounds really irresponsible of me as a director, but I didn't connect with the killer car at all. I connected with the characters. I connected with this kid and who's picked on by everybody and then whose personality begins to change through the car. And I always sort of assumed, well, the car scenes are something else. We'll worry about those later. But I didn't, I didn't do my job. It's my fault. I didn't make it scary enough. The movie wasn't scary. And uh, that, I look back on it, and I look back on it as a big lesson. You know, I won't do it again. And uh, I'm, I'm happy with some of the performances, and I'm happy with certain parts of the film. But I think that's one of the films I regret. I regret making it. By this time, the, the budgets for the movies that you were making had begun to increase. And with Starman, which you made in 1984, you had what was then the, the largest of the budgets that you'd had. Having worked on a small scale and, and had the kind of economy that you had developed then, <laughs> it's just water, I think. Did you... What? <laughs> Is this a comedy routine? No, no. Or? No, go ahead. <laughs> I'll just wait until you pour it and then I'll oh, ask okay. something. In moving up to that level of budget and having uh, Jeff Bridges uh, in the leading role, what were the advantages and the trade-offs that you found in moving into the heart of the Hollywood system, <coughs> which up to that point, really, you, you'd, been, you'd skirted? mostly in favor of independence and creative control. That was the biggest budget I had handled. That was an epic. That was a, epic. Uh, that was a cross-country epic. <clears throat> the man who was running the studio at the time was Guy McElwain, who has since uh, uh, left the management business, is now back in the agent business. And he had a lot of belief in me. And he said, look, I think you, know, you can direct this story. And he handed it to me. 
And for the first time in my career, somebody was offering me a romantic, sentimental love story. And I couldn't believe it, you know. It was like my hall, oh, thank you, thank you. And he was offering me a decent budget. <coughs> and uh, that was a great experience, making that film. It was, it was basically very simple. It's a story about two people on the road. And uh, we, all, we watched it happen one night. We watched uh, uh, a bunch of movies together, Karen Allen and Jeff Bridges and myself. And then Jeff came with this very strange alien that he wanted to do. And he would videotape himself, have his kids videotaping himself, playing this part. And he had a script. <clears throat> and the cover of the script was a, was a bird with his eye that stared at you. And he said, that Starman is just this bird. So you see his, his head moving around like he's doing this bird. And he was tremendous. And I recall the first day of shooting, he started to do this, and the crew went, oh, boy. <laughs> we are in trouble. <laughs> but when you cut the movie all together, he, he was great. It was wonderful. It was a wonderful experience. I wish the movie had been a bigger hit. Um, it did OK. Got some nice reviews. And it was nice. They said, now John Carpenter's redeemed himself after that awful thing movie, you know. <laughs> we can trust him now. He can do romantic comedies and stuff. On the other hand, in a, in a curious kind of way, there's, there's a kind of reverse to that, which is that the people who had loved your early low-budget genre movies, somehow, uh, when this happens, people turn to you and they say, oh, he's sold out. You know, he's now going to make this Hollywood pap and stuff. Yeah. And so people rejoiced when in fact it was announced that you were going to go back to making low budget movies and, and having creative control. And you signed, I think, what at the time was supposed to be a four picture deal and made two movies, which I very much like, Prince of Darkness and They Live. And did you see it in those terms? I mean, did you see it yourself <coughs> as a return to basics, as a return to the sort of low budget? And did you embrace it in that sense? I did. This was after uh, I made a picture called Big Trouble in Little China, which um, I had a great time making. But I worked at a studio with a rather infamous studio head who, who I butted right up against. It's, it's a terrible thing. It, I have a terrible time with authority. That's really awful. When somebody tries to tell me what to do, it's terrible. I'm awful. I'm really hard to get along with. If they're nice to me, they say, now, John, you know, I have a problem with this section and so forth. I, I love it. But when, when they start playing games, I get real nasty and mean. And I'm not very cooperative. And that, that was the situation. I had had it with the studios after that one. And they didn't get behind it, I felt, from my point of view. And I felt it was a real unique, great film. And so I wanted to go back and try movies in which I had complete control again. And the way to do that is to do low-budget films. Because once you, your budget is above a certain level, it has to make money because the studio is saying, we've invested all this in you. We've invested, what, 20 million, 30 million, 40 million. It has to make money. So you have all these people saying, well, let's do this and let's change this. And the pressure on you is, is tremendous. And it can kill a director. We lost a great director uh, years ago. I mean, George Miller was a director of the Mad Max series. He did a studio film. And he's quit directing afterwards. And he said, they mistake collaboration for weakness. Now, it, it's true, but guy, the guy shouldn't have quit. But they, they kicked his heart, you know. So my heart was pretty kicked after that. So I went back to low budget. It's something I knew. What did Hitchcock say? He ran, run, he ran for cover. Whenever he'd make something that, he tried an experiment with, with a, with, I think it was under Capricorn, and it really bombed. He went right back and did a, and did a suspense film again. Run for cover. Go back to what you know. So I went right back and did this uh, straight-out horror film. Your films have generally been fairly apolitical, and, and in an interview you've always denied that they, that they carry any particular message. But in the case of They Live, it's hard not to see it as a commentary on Reaganism and the, and the late 80s. <coughs> um, did you approach that idea with some trepidation, the idea of having a message in a movie? I mean, it still plays as a movie, but... Did it concern you that, that going in with that kind of anger might, might displace something in a film and be a problem? Well, I gave the interview in which I said, I don't do political movies, before Reagan was president. And, why, and then during his presidency, I, I, it, it just got so unbelievable. I said, I, no, somebody has to speak out here. And I mean, these people are from outer space. <laughs> Bang, there they are. <laughs> 
I just couldn't take it anymore. I mean, it's just, just, just outrageous. I mean, I, the country, I, I love my own country, but boy, oh boy, it went nuts. <laughs> Memoirs of an Invisible Man is a film which seems to me fascinating in the sense that it seems to contain within it all of the contradictions inv involved in its making. It's, it's a huge budget movie, $40 million. It's got Chevy Chase, who's a, a well-known actor with a, with a high profile. You've got Daryl Hannah as the, as the female lead. But what seems to be happening in the movie is that, on the one hand, there's this kind of light, fairly frivolous special effects comedy. And then on the other hand, there are scenes where the Chevy Chase character is saying incredibly dark, almost like existential things, where he's saying, but you don't understand. If you can't see me, I don't exist. I don't exist. Um, can you talk us through that film? Because in a way, that, that seems to exemplify the sort of uh, contradictions that you're talking about here. <coughs> That's precisely, you've hit exactly what happened. The studio wanted National Lampoon vacation, invisible vacation. Chevy wanted to move someplace else, you know, and he did a couple of really good scenes and he really pulled them off. He's a guy who's come from television, he's a comedian, and he needed a lot of support and he, he needed a lot of boosting and saying, you can do it. And I believed in it. And I believe that he could do a movie in which he balances, we can have some humor in it, but let's go ahead and play the dark side because it's a darker film. And I'm afraid um, when it came out, now again, you're a prisoner, when you make a movie, you're a prisoner of whatever is around you at the moment you're released. Whatever is happening in the society, whatever is happening in the world, and what other movies are released. Wayne's World comes out a week before us. And now we're coming out in Memoirs of Invisible Man, Chevy Chase. The audience says, okay, comedy. Because it wasn't. It wasn't Invisible Vacation. It was a more serious film. And that was the mistake. It didn't know what it was. That was why I wanted to do it, because it was a little of both. And I wanted to make an edgier movie. But the studio was, was, was uh, understanding. And they said, that's very nice. You did a good job. But it's not, you know, it's not going to make it. It's not one thing or another. The audience wants to know what they're going to see. Frank Price, what did he, what did he say? Here's movie making. Tell them what they're going to see. Tell them what they're seeing. Tell them what they've seen. <laughs> that's the way they think. Let's come right up to date within the Mouth of Madness, which uh, we saw the, or the audience saw the world premiere of uh, this evening, public premiere. You've had elements of H.P. Lovecraft in some of your earlier films. I, it, it seems to me that a lot of the atmosphere and, and, and the kind of stuff with the, the uh, zombie semen or whatever they are in uh, The Fog has elements of that. But this was the most overtly Lovecraft, you know, that were. A lot of people regard H.P. Lovecraft as a bit of a hack writer who had a lot of wild ideas, but I think your estimation of him is, is a bit higher than that, and was that one of the things that attracted you to the script when you were offered it? I've been trying to figure out how to do Lovecraft for many years, and it, it's I realize it's impossible. You can't do him. And a great example of Lovecraft is a story he wrote called The Outsider, which is the classic kind of Lovecraftian story. And it's now it's generic, but for the time, it's written in the 20s, this lonely man is living in an in a underground world, a very strange underground world. And he's all alone. He doesn't understand why he's there. And he wants to get out because his heart hurts and he's lonely. And he finds this staircase and he goes up and he opens the door and he's in this huge mansion. It's extremely quiet. There's nothing going on. And he wonders, where am I and who am I? And, and what is this world that I exist in? And this is all written with, with, with incredible poetry and you're in this guy's head, and suddenly he turns a corner, and there standing in front of him is this hideous, rotted corpse of a monster. And our hero goes, oh no, and he puts his hand out and touches the surface of a polished mirror. End of story. You can't shoot it. It's right here. It's right here in your head. He leads you right up to the last line and then delivers it. And he, he's a master at what he does. Okay, he wrote back in the 20s, and he wrote for pulp magazines, and all his writing is pulp writing. And he also kind of imitated some uh, English writers, and he tried to get his language going, and he tried to up his, up his craft, so to speak. But his ideas will stay with you for years. And I, 
So I was sitting around and saying, well, I can't do that. And along came in the mouth of madness, and here, literally, here is H.P. Uh, Lovecraft's mythos, the monsters from beyond that come through reality and come chasing, chasing after you. And I thought, this is it. I've got to try it. I've got to try it one time to see if I can pull it off. One of the other elements in the film, um, which I'm assuming for the sake of argument you uh, regarded as a plot device, is the idea that the novels written by the, the, uh, the missing writer uh, would have this effect upon the more vulnerable readers, the more unstable readers. Um, did you see that to some extent as a <coughs> sideswipe at the sort of moral guardians who claim that films like The Thing and books like those written by Stephen King, who obviously gets a bit of a nod here, um, have that effect up upon the, the <coughs> readers in question? Clearly. I mean, I, I think you're going through some big censorship things here now over video movies and murders. We're going through a lot of that in the United States now, too. And it's, uh, yeah, there was a, I, I'm a member of the Writers Guild, and they had this magazine. And I remember opening to an article that said, we now have scientific proof that watching violent programs on television will turn viewers into homicidal killers. I'm serious. And I, I would, what? <laughs> Say, what? Are you, you're kidding me. You can't, you can't be serious. And it's, it's this wild hysteria. I've been reading a lot about it. I think it has to do whenever there's, whenever certain folks think that the middle class mores are getting out of hand and they want to beat them down, they moralize a little bit, okay? And, you know, kids of, Kids have always killed. People have always killed. You, you, can, you can't censor a person's intention to kill. You can censor a movie. You can't censor a psychopath or a sociopath. You can censor a movie or a book. And uh, so I was having fun with it, yeah. yeah. And I think Jurgen Prock now has a line. He's, when, you, when you lose the ability to tell the difference between fantasy and reality, the old ones can come back. And that's, that's kind of... You know, there's some folks out there who are never going to see the difference between fantasy and reality. We had a, kill, a mass killer in the United States, Jeffrey Dahmer, and he's the, kind of a famous cannibal type guy. And he was haunted by Return of the Jedi for a oh, long I'm serious. <laughs> That's the movie that haunted him. Well, okay. Okay, guys, you know. <laughs> it is actually a little bit closer to home for you, of course, because there was, there was a case here in which a kid. Uh, claimed in his defense um, that he had <coughs> been spoken to by the Michael Myers characters in the Halloween films. He, uh, nobody in the court case uh, seemed to notice that the Michael Myers character in the Halloween films doesn't actually speak. Um, <laughs> it was glossed over at the time. Were you conscious of that? Did anyone contact you at, the, at that time to speak Some, to you? Somebody, somebody called me up for an interview and said, are you aware of this? And I, I wasn't. And... Uh, that's really sad. I mean, I, I mean, you're driving down in Los Angeles or any, any town in the world, and you see, you see a schizophrenic on the street, a bag person, okay? And you, see, you can see somebody walking along and having a conversation with nothing. In their minds, little, there's somebody they're talking to. And it's, uh, it's, it's beyond sad. So that's terrible. Uh, but <laughs> Michael Myers, I don't believe, was talking to him. And neither, there were no messages really in... I forget the rock group. Uh, I mean, th that stuff is just is uh, active, desperate people. Okay, I'm going to uh, throw it open now for your questions. Uh, bear with me, if you will, um, if I don't spot you immediately. I will try to sort of move my eyes around, and I may, um, if you could speak up, but I may just sort of pray see your questions, uh, just in case uh, some people can't hear. But um, can we take the first question, please? Yes, sir. Mr. Parker, you've spoken a little about um, film music. The only major director that I can think of that actually scored your own, or some of your own pictures, occasionally use someone like Morricone for the film. Really. But this seems to me to be interesting because, is it because you feel you, you know the subject matter so well you're happy to score it, or don't you have the confidence in the composer to give you what you want? Or can you talk about that? Because that interests me. Um, well, my dad, as I said, my dad was a music teacher, and I, I wanted to, uh, I was going to have a music career for a while. So um, I decided on movies, and this is one way to continue the music part of it. In the beginning, it was because I was cheap and fast. 
I'm the fastest and the cheapest guy I could find. And, and then it became something of a matter of love. And uh, uh, I love doing the scores. And it's uh, sometimes I get to work with someone like Ennio Morricone. And I, well, please, I'll step aside. You know, <laughs> I'll step aside in a second. But uh, I, I have a good time scoring horror movies. It's a lot of fun to score them. They're, they're, they're neat to score. You've got a great debt to Nigel Neal. Can you just explain a bit about that? And if you're back in communication with him now? Well, Nigel Neal is, a, for those of you not familiar with him, is a, a, he wrote uh, some very famous and groundbreaking science fiction television serials here in England, Quatermass Experiment, Quatermass 2, Quatermass in the Pit. And they were subsequently made into Hammer films back in the 50s. And in the United States, they were different titles. I went to see the Quatermass Experiment, and I don't think I was ever the same since. It terrified me, and I, I just loved his work. I think his work is sensational. And since then, he's done several other things. He's done some, some, uh, some plays and so forth. I've always been a giant fan of his, and uh, I haven't talked to him in years and years. It was, Ron Shusette wasn't on Dark Star. That was just Dan. Um, Alien was a pretty terrifying movie, wasn't it? That's pretty good. <laughs> the which one? The third film. Three? Yeah, everyone trashed it. But I, mean. uh, I thought that progressively the movies got bigger and bigger, and, and two was fun and grand. I, it felt like I'd seen it before. I didn't think the Alien was particularly scary in the third one, but... Uh, what do I know? <laughs> Can I just get back to uh, the Halloween cycle for a second, um, specifically Halloween 3? I'd be very curious to hear, A, what you think of the movie, <coughs> and B, why you didn't direct it yourself, given that I, when I viewed Halloween 3 for the first time, I thought that there was a lot of... It, it could have almost have been that, that you had been at the hell with certain parts of that, especially with the music score, which I really like. Well, I did do the music to it. Um, uh, we, we came time to do the Halloween sequels, and I won't go into, it's a long story, but I had to write Halloween 2, and I realized after three pages or four, we have no story. I've done this story. There is no, this is a repeat, it's a Xerox. I should just Xerox the first script, change the names, and we'll do it again. <laughs> it was terrible. I couldn't do this. I can't do this. There is no story there. So they wanted to do three. So I thought, well, let's do, then let's, do another story, another horror story. And, and Joe Dante, at the time I was talking to him, I said, you want to do something? He said, well, Nigel Neal has an idea. So Nigel Neal had this idea that, that you see. And I got the art director on, on uh, uh, Halloween, Tommy Lee Wallace, he directed it. And I did the music. And I enjoy it a whole lot. I love the film. Uh, the audiences came in expecting Halloween, they were the, the character. And when they saw it wasn't Halloween, they went, ooh, <laughs> and walked out. Just in the middle there. You, you were talking earlier on about the upcoming Criterion Laser Disc release of Halloween. You were talking earlier about the upcoming Criterion Laser Disc release of Halloween. Yeah. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about this? And are there any plans to do any of your other films, in particular the thing? Well, the thing has been done. Universal put out a beautiful widescreen laser disc. I recommend it highly. It's some of the best color I have ever seen, some of the best work I have ever seen. Those guys finesse that thing. It's beautiful and it's in full Dolby sound and you get into your home entertainment and crank up the ProLogic and you'll have a great time. Um, <laughs> Escape from New York has just been done. Assault on Precinct 13 has just been done. And Halloween will be done for this Halloween. freedom do you give the editor, the director of photography, and how much creative control do you keep yourself? Well, <laughs> that's, that's hard. That's a hard one. Uh, I was lucky enough to get John Carpenter's on, out of Halloween for because I basically did that movie for no money. So I said, look, 
look, I'm not going to charge anything, but you've got to let me have final cut, and you've got to let me put John Carpenter's on it. Because I wanted to, you know, put my name on it. <laughs> and uh, um, movies are collaborative, man. I mean, you know, I don't walk in and say, you do this here and put the camera there. I mean, it doesn't work that way. Uh, I have a style of directing, but, you know, we, have a, we try to have a good time. And I'm not going to tell Sam Neill how to act in a scene, you know. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to tell Kurt Russell. I'm not going to tell these kung fu guys, I'm going to do it like this. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. I mean, the editor, they, people bring things and make my move, what I've done better. I depend on them to save my butt. When I screw up, you know, I mean, because uh, uh, I don't think there's anybody who's ever made a movie. I mean, Orson Welles said this. This is all, you know, this stuff is ridiculous. You know, it's collaborative. You get together and you work on it with someone. And uh, I, I'm saved all the time by my director of photography. Saves me, saves me all the time. Okay. Yeah, I'm wondering, uh, could you give me some advice uh, in terms of how to... How to get an agent in Hollywood? Let me that advice. Um, <laughs> but in terms of advice into how to break into, into direction, uh, and also as a director yourself, what you feel the most important aspect that a director should have like his weaponry. How do you become a director? How do you become a rock and roll star? I don't know. You're in the right place at the right time with a, with a voice. It's luck. It's tenacity. It's impossible. And you have to be extremely lucky, but you have to be real thick-skinned. And you have to be prepared. I'll say, I'll say something. Well, I won't say it now. I can't say it. Uh, um, it's real tough, OK? Uh, and it ages you. Every movie takes gouge out of your skin. So you might as well accept that. How do you break in? You have to force your way in. Nobody wants you. you know, they don't want you coming around. They've got enough. They, you know, they'll do it. Thank you. Go away. Um, the way to get in is write. Write a great screenplay that every studio must have now. Must have right now. Sell it for a lot of money. Okay? Make a lot of money. Then write another one that they must have. And then you say, ah, 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 I direct this one. <laughs> That's how you get in. Would you actually, in terms of when you, if you could get to direction, would you, what kind of, would you say is the most important quality that a good director needs when it comes to shooting? Uh, what's the most important quality? Strong legs, <laughs> uh, vision, a leader, get people to do what you want, however you get it done. Any other questions? Nobody has questions. Sleep notes to your to the album Print of Darkness. You was talking about quantum mechanics and quantum physics, and you'd like to um, do that in another film. Will you do that in another film, or if I could figure out how to visualize it, uh, I would. It's, I, I got real fascinated with wave-particle duality. It kind of blew my mind when I realized what it was about. But I've tried many times to fictionalize it, and it's impossible to do. So it was just a background inspiration. I don't think I can do it. I don't think it's possible. Right at the back. Yeah, um, you've talked many times about how your... Can you speak up? Um, many of your films you said are based on Westerns. And when are we going to see a Western Ah, uh, I don't think they'll let me do one. Um, I don't know. I mean, right now what's popular is the left wing... Um, um, uh, kind of left-wing, uh, politically correct westerns, you know, Dances with Wolves and stuff. And that's not my kind of stuff, so. Uh, I'd, love to do, I'd love to do a western with Kurt Russell. It'd be fun. I'd love to remake Rio Bravo. It would be fun, but I've already kind of done that, so. Um, th th I don't get considered or hired, really, to do, to do that kind of thing anymore. I'm kind of, I'm typecast as a genre director, and that's, that's where I function. And it's really fun being there. I love it. I love, I love the movies that I do. Maybe one day someone will come along and slap something down. We'll see. Um, just there. Do you think it's possible before you put uh, pen to paper to actually write a cult film? Do you think it's possible before you put pen to paper that you're 
I want to make a cult film. So does a writer sit down and say, I want to make a cult film? What's a cult film? I don't know what a cult film is. I have no idea what that is. I don't know what it means. I never have known what that means. So I don't know how to answer you. You tell a story. You don't say, I'm going to make a... You try to make it, you do it the best. All you can do is your best job telling a story using your voice, your style, and see what happens. But no, there's no way. What do you think of their um, sequels to Halloween? Four and five, and they're doing six. I know, I know. <laughs> I love the checks they send, man, let me tell you. I, I watched I, I I watched one of them. It's pretty dispiriting. I you know I, I don't know what to say about it. Good luck to them. Um, you've, you've mentioned Hammer films, uh, particularly Quite a Mass, as a fond memory and an influence on your work. And we hear that Universal actually going back now and remaking Hammer films. Is there any particular Hammer project that you would like to helm as a remake? Guess which one. <laughs> Quatermass. I think they're, they're, not, they're not doing Quatermass first, but I think I would, I would be a perfect choice <laughs> to do it. And I guarantee you, they will not offer it to me. One of the lines in the film about madness is that reality isn't what it used to be. In the times that we live in now, with the likes of O.J. Simpson, and people know to see Hannibal the Cannibal. It's like, I mean, how do you see the future of, of kind of films in that way? The other question that tends to connect it to that loosely is that you seem to be the perfect director to have made a serial killer film. You seem to be the only one who hasn't done one of the project. Who hasn't done one of what, what projects? Serial, serial the, killer the current movie. spat of serial killer movies. Well, well I kind of did that once. Uh, uh, I, I, this is an age beyond parody. Let me put it to you that way. It's an age of, uh, it's, it's, we're approaching the millennium and everybody's very tense very, very tense across the world. Um, the biggest thing I can say to you about the, the kind of movies that are coming out, I, I don't know how to describe it, other than the fact that the thing that got me the most about O.J. Simpson was I was watching the playoffs between the Houston Rockets and the New York Knicks, and here comes this chase on TV. And some reporter says, and this is a chase like Steven Spielberg might stage. And I thought to myself, are you kidding? This is boring. <laughs> You're going 35 miles an hour, Spielberg would have that thing flying. What's going on here? Where's the basketball game? Will they ever be released in their theatrical films on video? And will you be able to control the price? Control the price? <laughs> I can sell you my own films. Just come and bring your wallet right up here now, and I'll take care of you. You know, I don't know. I don't really have any control on when they distribute films. I don't know. I never know. Uh, I know when they come out in Laserdisc, because I, I make movies in widescreen, when you see it, unless it's a widescreen videotape, you know, don't, don't buy it. I can't guarantee anything. If you get a laser disc, it'll have your Dolby sound on it, and it'll be a beautiful, clear image. That means it's been massaged through this process. It's the best we can do now for your home television screen. And I recommend laser discs to you. Don't, don't fool around with video unless you get rare things that you have to see. You know, laser discs is the way to go, young man. <laughs> Um, which of your films do you get the most personal pleasure from, and which do you think? Always the next one. <laughs> Seriously, the next one. And which of the films that you've already made do you feel was probably your greatest critical success? <coughs> Never mind what the critics say. Man, I don't know. Every one of them in its own way has been put down so heavily, and then later has been praised. So I can't, I don't know. I don't, I can't make sense of it. You should ask him this question. Have you had any cameo roles, and what are you playing with? I've had cameo roles in several films. My acting name is Rip Hate. <laughs> H-A-I-G-H-T, Rip Hate. I play helicopter pilots because I am a helicopter pilot, so I'm cheap and I can do it. <laughs> uh, I just did a, a serious TV thing in, uh, in the United States. It may not be available. It's called Body Bags. And <laughs> 
It was, it was amazing. And I play this dead guy. I play a coroner. And Rick Baker came in and for about three or four hours in the middle of the night put this incredible, uh, awful makeup on me and I did this part. When it comes out on Laserdisc or video, I rec you know, you can see it and you'll find out why Rip Hate doesn't work much. <laughs> Just that. Do you have a, a personal favorite film and uh, are there any directors working today that you actually rush to go and see at the movies when the movies come out? <coughs> well, I've really, there's a lot of good directors working. Uh, I'm a big fan of Quentin Tarantino and I love John Woo's stuff, it's great. And, uh, um, I mean, um, there's a lot of good directors working. My favorites are from the old days, though. Uh, my favorite director is Howard Hawks. He's influenced me more than anybody else. Just his way of approaching a story and telling it. And I, I have several favorites among my own films. It depends on what mood I'm in. You know, I mean, I really like The Thing. I like Big Trouble. I like They Live. And I mean, and you usually like the last one you've done. And I mean, somebody else. Look, your personal yeah. film is actually some other director. I mean, you mentioned uh, Tarantino, who a lot of people either think it's a genius or think that he's just ultra-violent. I mean, what do you think of something like Pulp Fiction or Reservoir? Reservoir Dogs is a great movie. It's fun. It's, it's really funny and ridiculous and violent. Uh, no, and he's, real, he's got a real vision. This guy's, this guy's for real. I like it a lot. Let's run at the back. Uh, two things, John. Uh, I sat my girlfriend down recently and put three of your movies on. And the only thing she said at the end of it was that you were obsessed with helicopters. <laughs> <laughs> a, is that true? And B, were there any changes you would make to the second half of Play Live? A, it's true, I'm obsessed with helicopters. And B, no. That was shorter than the three movies you sat through. Um, over here. Um, hang on, I'll take you from the front back. Yeah, there. And what was your involvement with Armed and Dangerous? Armed and Dangerous. I was going to do Armed and Dangerous at one point, and Dan Aykroyd said, look, I want the ending changed to a car chase. And I said, let's don't. And he said, I won't do it unless we do. And I said, goodbye. Just behind and then behind again. Just uh, there's Big Trouble in Little China, and you've already mentioned Hard Boiled. Did Hong Kong movies influence your work? Yeah, big time. And uh, there was one, I, I don't know, it's been released under several different titles. Um, Warriors of Mystic Mountain, I think, was one version of it. Oh, what a movie. Whoa! I thought, look at this. Yeah, I love Hong Kong Kung Fu movies. They're incredible. And I got a chance to make a big time one. Go back to helicopters. Are you ever going to make Chicken Hawk? No. Why? <laughs> <laughs> it's a long, involved story. To make that into a movie that has, um, what can I say, that has dramatic qualities, you have to take away from the guy, the man who wrote the book, okay? You have to take away from his story a little bit. And, uh, you know, he went through a lot. So he doesn't want to take away, he wants his story told, and I, I couldn't do it. I couldn't tell his story. Right. Yeah, what stage is Village of the Damned in? Well, let's see, we start shooting September 13th. So it's pretty close. And who's in it? Christopher Reeve. And? <laughs> Christopher, Reeve, Christopher Reeve, Kirstie Alley, Linda Kozlowski have been cast so far. We start shooting September 13th in Northern California for Universal Pictures. Coming soon <laughs> to your theater. Uh, at the back. Um, one, one of the best aspects of the sort of Precinct 13 was the performance of Laurie Zimmer. What, 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 what ever happened to her? She went on, she was in some television work and uh, just kind of drifted out of the business, I believe. Okay. Just that. How much faith have you got in this new film? How much faith have you got in this new film? <laughs> Which new one? I just watched. Did you just watch? Uh, a fair amount. Would you have liked to have directed Interview with a Vampire? Nope. Man, you can't mine vampires much more than they have been in movies. I, that's a pretty stale territory. Um, somebody else would be better for that one. Just a... Uh, there's the fight sequence in the middle of day live. It's always reminded me of a scene in the, the end of The Quiet Man. 
except they all get bruises. Yeah. Very good. Very good. You got it. <laughs> Do you know that, that we rehearsed that scene for what, a month and a half? And the actors got so good at it that they were making full contact. In other words, it's not the swing miss that you see all the time. I mean, they were, they were going at it. They did all, there's no stuntmen in that scene. It was great. It was a great fight. You talked earlier on in the interview about, you know, is this my ticket to Hollywood? Is this my ticket to Hollywood? Um, are there a couple of moments which for you might crystallize, this is A, what's great about Hollywood, and B, <laughs> what is absolutely terrible about working in Hollywood? Oh, man. Well, I really seriously, it's hard, to, it's hard to, to think of one moment. I can think of lots of moments that are, that are really great and really terrible. I mean, there are lots of them that indicate that. Uh, you never like to ha be combative with um, the people that you're working for, the heads of studios. It's not fun. You never, you never like to have a problem with an actress. You never like to have a narrative problem in your film. I mean, there are terrible times along the way when you're trying to learn what the rules are. But the great times is, I mean, you see an audience see a movie and respond. I mean, there's, there's nothing better than that. That's pretty hot. And I think then it makes it all worth it, all worthwhile. But um, nothing crystallizes particularly now. John, going back to the scene in Salt Precinct 13 where you shoot the little girl, did you worry about that at the time? Did I worry about it in terms of censorship and so forth? Actually, I didn't really, um, and I probably should have. That movie couldn't be made now. And, um, but it was so brief, I just clipped it real quick. We're running out of questions, guys, huh? Can I get out of here? We were looking for a distributor, because we had the movie, okay, and we needed somebody to distribute it, and we showed it to uh, everybody. Nobody wanted it, except Jack Harris, who had a very small distribution company, who said, let me, I'm gonna put some more money into it, I want you to reshoot shoot certain scenes and, and so forth. So he was the guy who put the bucks up to get us where we needed to be. Okay, uh, just one. Did you did you personally supervise the transfer of uh, Halloween for Criterion? Uh, it hasn't been done yet, but I will. I shall. I'm going to. I'm going to ask just one last question, and it is this. Um, you've remained true to the genre. A lot of directors start off with low-budget movies and then, having made a couple of movies, they then move up and try to get into the mainstream. But you've remained true to the genre throughout. Do you think that you'll continue to do that? Obviously, Village of the Damned is the next movie, and is that something that you've enjoyed doing? <coughs> well, yeah, I, I feel a great uh, love for fantasy and horror and science fiction. I've always had since I've been a kid. And this is the girl who brought me, basically asked me to the prom. She brought me, and so I'm going to keep dancing with her because she's a beautiful, and I love her very much. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much, John Carpenter.